wake up night. You must take up your arms again. This is all very confusing. I've been playing King Arthur Knight's Tale because you have no time to gain. Welcome to the next When the Credit Roll review, a series in which I only review a game once the credits have rolled, so you can have some faith that I may actually know a little bit about what I'm talking about, maybe, possibly. So first up, the basic details. King Arthur Knight's Tale was released on the 26th of April 2022, was developed by Neocore Games for PC. It took me roughly 40 hours to see the credits roll. This is an interesting game story-wise, as it sees us reprising the role of not Arthur, but Mordred. King Arthur was killed, and in his dying breath he slew Mordred, but something has gone wrong. Upon Arthur arriving into Avalon, his soul was split and has become corrupted, so the Lady of the Lake, in an attempt to reset the balance of the land, revives the only being that can kill Arthur, that being Mordred. Mordred is an interesting fellow. He seems to generally care for the people of his nation, but in the same token is also an absolute knob, who is quite happy to murder anyone that displeases him. The rest of the cast is quite flexible due to the permanent death nature of the game and all the various routes you can take, but it doesn't stop it from having some interesting recurring characters. Throughout the plot, the dudes and dudettes you get all have something to say. My group ended up being an odd mix of Mordred, for me, who was an hardcore follower of the old faith and an absolute tyrant. And to go with him, he had Merlin and the Red Knight, who were also followers of the old faith. We also had Lady Dindrain. Didra Didraini. I also took Lady Didrain, who was a devout Christian. So you get an odd mix of quotes coming in from the uh, followers of the old faith and the praying to God. Anyway, the Red Knight was a particular favourite, as he also, like Mordred, was a dick, but surprisingly funny. This is a dark game with dark things. It's classic dark fantasy, but it doesn't stop it from having a bit of a blunt humour and a bit of a sarcastic nature about it. And one of the things you can do is, in conversations, you tend to get lots of op options about what you can select. And oh, some of them are, are quite funny. <laughs> it meant I just had to click those. Usually, Mordred being a sarcastic asshole, and it's just to see the response and the confusion on some of the other people with his responses. Yeah, well, yeah, it's great fun. It's this game is not for someone who enjoys playing the noble hero, as I believe even if Mordred goes down the hero route, it doesn't stop him being him. So we know the story. We have a basic understanding. So we know the story, and we have a basic understanding of the tales of King Arthur. I vaguely use this reference. But what is a King Arthur's Knight's Tale? It's actually quite interesting, as it's a turn-based tactics game, but it also has a lot of elements you'd expect from, say, a CRPG. Something in the veins of, like, Baldur's Gate or Pillars of Eternity, but in a much cut-down manner compared to those two. And it even has a little bit of base management as well. So there are three levels to the game the like map slash your base screen, the area mission exploration screen, and finally the battles themselves. The map screen has firstly all the various missions that you can take on it across its map, um, with yellow ones being main quests and side ones being purple. Some of the side ones are even story chains in of themselves and vary depending on the routes you've taken on the morality chart that the game has. You also get these little events which usually involve just making a choice um, and these are what send you down the various morality routes usually. So you might be given a choice that keeps you neutral, one that sends you old faith or one that sends you plain Christian. Um, sometimes though you get the option of sending out a knight at the round table to complete the mission and so you can't use them in your next mission and they come back either successfully or failed and it's usually worth reading the description try and figure out which knight would be best to send 
also um, with the choices that you make some of them other than just having a morality effect will also impact your resources so some of them cost gold to resolve or resources used to build your buildings and your main base and sometimes they even affect the loyalty of characters so always make sure to read all the options available and choose what's right for you and how you're playing through it um, Camelot itself has a number of buildings that you develop using both gold and generic resources over time in a way that feels best for you so the order in which you unlock them and which buildings you fully upgrade and such it, it all depends on how you're playing the game so for me I built up um, Camelot itself like the round table um, followed by the training ground so the buildings themselves are the round table which um, lets you set laws which give usually like a positive benefit uh, or activate decree de activate decrees which can be used to get like an instant resource um, but then they take they have like a several mission cooldown then the training ground is next um, this basically revolves around leveling up your characters that you aren't using in that mission so you can just leave them in there and they'll slowly every couple of missions they will level up or you can actually pay just to have it a complete level them up over one mission and depending on how far away they are from leveling XP wise will depend on how much it costs uh, next you have like the enchanted towers and the merchants both of them are basically shops the merchants use gold and the enchanted tower uses something called like relic dust which is used from destroying um, gold colored items it has a classic item rarity scale so like blue and green and gold and such uh, the last ones are the cathedral and the hospice these are used for covering your knights in different ways depending on how they're injured but this is a good chance to discuss what makes up a knight beyond the basic stats and skills you would normally expect so knights come with a set of positive and negative quirks to start with uh, this can be like they if you don't take them out into a mission every time they will lose loyalty if they're injured they might lose loyalty if you use them stuff like that um, but some of them are positive and it'll be like if they are in charge of a certain building because the buildings can have usually most of them one person that can be one knight that can look after them and if they've got a positive quirk for that it will give you a better benefit so the knights also have a loyalty rating a, the knights also have a loyalty rating basically the more loyal they are the more buffs they get and if they become disloyal then they get negative buffs or debuffs I should say um, these can all be affected in a number of ways so you could like I said on the events before that can affect the loyalty or making them in charge of buildings especially the round table that can positively affect loyalty and just doing certain things um, or even being the correct like old faith or tyrant or whatever as they all have their own like alignments it can affect their loyalty as well so like I just said they, the knights have an alignment themselves so like your character can build all of them have them so some of them are Christian some of them follow the old faith some of them are good some of them bad and some of them are just neutral now none of them will leave you for having a different ideolo ideology but you are going to struggle to raise that loyalty up now one of the major stats in King Arthur is very different to the rest is the health system so it doesn't it's not just basic HP we kind of have three levels to it with a fourth edition so the first is armor now armor is brilliant and it's kind of like if you can raise armor it's even better because it just absorbs a hit so the more armor you have the more hits you can just absorb before it affects anything else it doesn't matter if they do how much of the damage they do it just kind of absorbs it then we have 
basic HP. So your normal health, this is kind of the orange bar and acts as HP. When you get hit, it goes down and it regenerates between missions. Great. It's easy to recover, so potions and stuff like that all work on it. But then you get vitality. Uh, this is, once it's damaged, it's very difficult to recover. Um, basically, once you run out of HP and armor, vitality starts getting hit. It's the green bar. And once you run out of vitality, your character Unite is permanently dead. Um, so yeah, it's not great to run out. <laughs> You can recover it though. Like I said, it's just a bit more difficult. Sometimes you get a lucky shrine that will recover it, but none of the potions and stuff like that will. This is where the hospice and the cathedral come into play, as these will actually recover your vitality and injuries. You receive injuries as your vitality starts getting damaged. And these injuries will then like broken arm and such that reduce your effectiveness. It'll take time in the hospice and the cathedral to recover from these injuries and recover your vitality. Um, you do get injury tokens for some of your characters based on accessories and stuff like that that you're wearing. And these can stop you from receiving an injury, which is quite good. But knowing running out of vitality and getting injuries takes time. You can pay gold to have it one mission, but if you've lost both vitality and have injuries, that's basically two missions that character's out for. So it's not good. So a lot of the game is making sure you don't get into that green. Also, while you're on this screen, don't forget to equip your weapons, your armor, your accessories, consumables, all that sort of stuff. And if you've leveled up, don't forget to spend your skill points on upgrading your skills or buying new ones. The skill system is pretty cool. It's very simple. You get skills, and then a lot of them, a lot of the attack skills have four little additions they can be added on to as well. Um, and then once you've spent a certain number of skill points, you unlock the next tiers of skills and rinse and repeat. Um, also, while in this area, be sure to look out for the special items you get from hitting certain goals, like killing a certain number of one type of enemy or completing, building up an entire building and all their upgrades. These rewards come as a permanent buff item, which you can give to any character. But a character can only have four of them, so make sure to use them wisely. And obviously if your character dies, then they're permanently gone, and you've lost that permanent upgrade. So the next level of gameplay is the CRPG-esque exploring a map. So once you've selected a mission and gone into it, selected your, your guys to go into it, kind of get like a the classic isometric or top-down view and you can click around or use the controls to walk around the map um, and you'll have certain objectives to finish this probably usually killing the bad guy or um, stopping certain things happening in certain areas uh, and it's just you get to wander around the map exploring looking like looking for loot so you have like chests and stuff like that. Um, and if your character has a high enough perception, they can find stuff on the floor that was hidden. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Like I said before, I briefly mentioned the shrines. These shrines will give you a positive or negative buff. And if you have a sorcerer, then they can usually tell you if it's a good or bad thing to use. If you don't, it's a bit of a gamble. You also interact with a lot of NPCs in this. Some of them are friendly. Most of them end up in a fight. Uh, the friendly NPCs are usually there to give you side quests or push forward the main quest. Some of them even join you in battle. Um, and some of them will give you a shiny buff if you pay them some gold. You also have the fire sides, like the so like a camp that you can rest and there's usually a bunch of these on the map and um, what they do is they can either restore a chunk of your health for every character or a chunk of your armor now like i said before um, armor was big for me i felt that was the best level of health to be taking a hit on so i tended to re be recovering my armor more than my hp i only tend to take recover the hp if they were like on the line 
because there's usually other ways like potions and stuff like that to recover it but yeah overall it's it's a very cut down crpg experience <laughs> that's in like in a very tight short map <laughs> As opposed to like your boulders gates, right? Which are vast worlds to explore in that way. But a lot of the times, like I said, you'll meet an NPC or you'll walk into an area. And sometimes these are marked, sometimes they're not. So sometimes you can actually choose which angle you want to go in to a battle. But it all leads then to the battle system. And King Arthur and Knight's Tale follows the classic grid based, turn based combat. Um, we usually have four knights and sometimes guest characters and then there's even missions where we get a bunch of allies as well which um, can lead to quite a large-scale battles uh, that get a bit complex in managing everyone we don't control the allies they're, they're ai controlled but we get to control our four knights and if someone joins us so it's a kind of a classic format it's i go you go so we move all our guys the enemy moves all theirs and then the allies tend to move. Sometimes though, we say allies, sometimes it's just two opposing forces and they're also opposed against us, which makes for a three-way fight, which is quite fun. So there's quite a lot going on in just the aspect of who's on the map. So a turn revolves around the fact that we have a number of action points. So each character has a number of action points and you can actually flick between them as you go. You don't have to use up all of one character and then move to the next and use all theirs. You can literally like mix and match as you go. So like move one, move another one, attack with one, etc. Each action costs the points. So different skills cost different amounts of action points. Uh, movement usually costs one and the diagonal costs two. So it's all got to be balanced there. Um, there's also, if you have any action points left over at the end of your turn, when you hit end turn, you get some back for the next turn. Not all of them, just a small amount, maybe one or two, which actually can be quite useful for next turn if you manage that all well. Um, so your skills themselves tend to be like attack or movement skills. Um, certain characters also have a hide option, depending on their class. Uh, once you select your action, if it's a move, you just move to whatever square. If it's an attack, then you obviously have to be in range. Um, you have to see the area of effect. Most of them are single hit, but then like mages especially have like large areas they can hit, and you can hit your own guys. So be careful. Um, there's also then status effects that these can be applied. So status affecting enemies is very important in this game. Burning just does time over time, like damage over time. Poisoning actually is slightly weaker than burning, but reduces their attack. You can also knock them down, stun them, and this can be quite important for managing how the enemies are coming at you, um, because back attacks are a thing in this game as well. There's also the option, if you don't want to move as such, you can go into Overwatch, that um, then if enemies come into your range, you can shoot them. So this is very good for your archer characters maybe sat at the back and the enemies are just out of their range so you just set them into overwatch and they can get one or two attacks off depending on how many action points you use to go into overwatch depends on how many turns they get to like how many actions they get to take in overwatch you don't control this it just happens whoever walks into their range first gets hurt uh, it's got a pretty cool little system as well so as you go to move you get to see the grids around you either orange like orange yellowy or green if they move in the green that means they can still take it their basic attack action every character has a basic attack it looks like a skill and it's varies across the characters but if you moved in the green you can actually see then that they get to still act at, at that turn or get an overwatch off if they've moved into the yellow sections then they are now overspent they might still be able to use other skills so if i take mordred for example his basic attack costs three or four points I it was three for me um, i may have used a skill to upgrade that but his dash cost one action point by the end of the game for me so he could move pretty much his entire movement then dash um dash is a cool skill it runs at the enemy so for a distance and then knocks them down as well and knocks them back a tile so it's pretty cool 
But yeah, overall, it's not the most complex system. It's pretty traditional in a sense. For if you played a lot of games that use action point systems, then you'll feel right at home. The the big twists in this are the health system. It's managing that because you don't get a healer in this game. There are a couple of heal skills, but you don't get a, there's no healer class. Someone who brings a lot of healing spells with them. Um, the only healing spell I had was from a item for example so yeah it's a lot of managing that health system and trying your best to make sure you don't get surrounded and battered that way so that's where your knockback skills come in and all of this and it's pretty fun so yeah what was good about the game well for me personally I loved the story Mordred is such an interesting character to play as he isn't the normal peppy hero archetype that's got to find his way and make friends and all that sort of nonsense, he's very much a, madri a very driven, matured individual. He knows what he is, he knows what he wants, and he's also a sarcastic twat. This comes along with what I'd say is a solid battle system. It's not innovative in any way, but it's fun and easy to understand, and it's very effective. And there's actually quite a lot of variety in the game as well so you'll be doing a lot of the same battles and in a mission you'll tend to be fighting the same type of enemy but there's lots of enemy types to potentially face so you've got like basic knights bandits the undead picts and even more as you go through the games these get mixed in with each other and not all of them get on like i said so this can be give you three-way battles which is just cool <laughs> and overall it stopped me from getting bored for over the 40, 40 hours, I never felt at any time I just wanted it to end. I was actually wanted to keep playing. And there is an end game feature that allows you to keep playing. On the negatives, the theme isn't for everyone. Mordred being Harry is will turn some people off. And honestly, I get that. The dark fantasy, the sarcasm and all that isn't for everyone. For me, it is. But for others, it won't be. Um, you're not, you won't be playing this for that fancy high hero power of friendship nonsense. It's not that. <laughs> and yeah, that could be a negative for many. The other one is only being able to have four knights can feel a bit limiting. You, you can have a bunch of other knights spare lounging around, but you can only take four with you into battle. Um, sometimes you get a buddy, depending on the mission, but usually it's just four. And that can be a little bit limiting. Like, I always like to use more. I like I like big battles, but honestly, though, I still got to the end of the game, and I still loved it. So it's a small gripe, if anything. But anyway, let's have a quick look at what the critics thought before I give my final thoughts. So it got... On Metacritic, a 76 from the critics and a 7.9 or a 79 from the users. I don't know. It just feels a bit low to me. So I don't know whether this is a case of a game just hit all the right elements for me or people are being a bit harsh on it. It's always hard to tell in these instances with this sort of thing. But yeah, personally, I'd, I'd score it higher. So yeah, overall, from its fun and grim story to its tight tactical combat, King Arthur and Knight's Tale is an amazing entry into the turn-based tactic genre, standing among the greats of not just the modern era, but all time. It's a game all tactics fans should consider giving a go, and I reckon and non-tactics fans that like the King Arthur myths will get a kick from this as well. So my rating is must play. <laughs>